We're running. Good. Uh, interview with Mr. Uh, Wayne S. Rainsford. Uh, the date is now uh, 25, 26 December, uh, year 2000. Time is 0915. Interviewer is Lieutenant Colonel Robert Von Hassel. Place of interview is Latham, New York. Uh, Mr. Rainsford, tell me about your life before you entered the service. Where were you born? Where did you grow up? I was born in Albany, uh, but I lived in Voorheesville uh, most of my life. Went to the local high school. Uh, uh, took a college entrance course uh, and uh, decided to go on a scholarship to Green Mountain College in Vermont. Uh, after one year, uh, well, when I went there, the war had started, of course, and uh, I, uh, I was actually up for draft before I finished my freshman year, but they let me finish the, the freshman year uh, during uh, the time we were given the opportunity to apply to a, either a naval V-12 program that they called it or an Army ASTP program. Uh, I applied to the naval V-12. Uh, I passed all the tests except the physical. Uh, went up to Burlington, Vermont. Uh, and flunked the color test, eye color test, uh, which I guess was kind of important to the Navy. Uh, I guess it, we would have ended up in the Naval Air Corps. And uh, so I went through the normal channels of going through the draft, uh, but um, upon induction, they asked if anybody had passed the uh, either the Army or Naval test, and anybody that did was eligible to join the Naval or the, the Army program. And uh, of course, we jumped at that opportunity and, uh, and went into the Army Specialized Training Program, which was, theory was we were supposed to, after basic, to go back to college, take either pre-med, pre-engineering, pre-something else with the atmosphere to learn Japanese, Spanish, something, some language. Uh, so we had to go through basic training. I went through basic training at Fort Benning, Georgia, the infantry school, 13 weeks of basic training. Uh, upon completion of that, they sent us to the college of their choice. I went to Lafayette College in Eastern Pennsylvania uh, with an engineering uh, course, even though I never had any in high school. Uh, we, uh, the, prog the program uh, was supposed to last on, uh, for the completion of, as far as we know, uh, until you graduated, but uh, the war at that time, uh, they had the invasion of uh, Europe, and uh, the whole program was completely stopped, uh, and all that were in all of the colleges throughout the country had uh, enter, most of them entered combat service, mostly infantry. Uh, we were, weren't given any chance to go to OCS, even though we were promised that opportunity. Uh, <coughs> most of the, as far as I knew, most of the uh, people in the program went into infantry units that were depleted, sad, very sad infantry divisions. Uh, uh, and uh, the division that w we were assigned to was the 84th Rail Splitter Division, which was, uh, they had kicked out half of the incompetent troops in the division before that, and 
put us in with mostly uh, uh, people from the southwestern United States, Indians and so forth, and uh, from the beginning it was uh, big problems between the 50 percent of the people in, in the division were college people with IQs higher than officers candidate school. The other half of the division uh, were mostly illiterates. And it was, I, we felt it was non-combat ready. Uh, but uh, we went through training at Camp Claiborne, Louisiana. And uh, we were supposed to be the in the glider troops. We were trained for glider troops, uh, but it, it never materialized with us. Uh, we went, we were sent overseas. Uh, we were supposed to be the first division to land on the coast of France directly from the United States, first full, full division. Uh, but because of submarine activity, we were spread all over the Atlantic. Some of us went to Scotland. Part of our division went to Scotland, part to uh, England, part to Ireland. And uh, so we, with that, we got a little vacation from going into combat for about two months, I believe. And uh, finally, uh, we went across the con uh, the channel uh, as a full division, uh, went immediately to the front uh, with no combat experience. Um, we started uh, combat directly on the Holland-German -Germ border at the start of the Siegfried Line. Um, we were under bombardment for about a week before we actually knew wh what we were going to do and what our assignments were. Uh, we finally found that our assignment, we, we were actually attached to the, to the English Army at that time. I believe it was the 9th English Army. Um, we found our assignment was to take the Roar, R-O-E-R, river in three days. This was in uh, November, about a, a month before the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, we had no indications that the Germans were building up uh, their activity to, for the pre-Bulge operation. Uh, uh, we were directly on the border. Uh, we were in a small town that one day the Germans had it and the next day the Americans had it and it was uh, back and forth. Um, yeah, but uh, we, we fully expected to go through and take the river within three days. Uh, immediately after we got into heavy combat, uh, we had we were told that we would meet very little resistance from the Germans, that it would be what they called the Volkstrom, which means people's army, which means retired farmers and uh, very young kids and so forth uh, that had no combat experience. Uh, that our reconnaissance said that would be the what we wouldn't be against. Um, we had no air support because of weather conditions. Uh, our only um, mechanical, demechanized on our side were three Sherman tanks operated by English drivers who had been, supposedly been through the African campaign. Uh, our actual combat experience in the villages was in the village of Gillenkirchen. Uh, 
which was a small village, and we got into the town, uh, took the streets street by street, threw bombs in every cellar. The Germans were in every cellar hiding. We got them out, and we expected uh, to go on further. All of a sudden, I, among others, and I, I as far as I know, I noticed a column of a large column of German tanks over the hill, and uh, I think they were Mark IVs or Tigers, I don't know, big things. And uh, I went over and told one of the ones in our Sherman tanks what was coming. Uh, five minutes later I looked and they had turned around and took off on us and we had nothing to combat their tanks. We had the, the only thing we had were bazookas, which at that time I remember pretty truthfully, they were in two pieces. One man handled one part and the other man handled the other part, and because of injuries and deaths and so forth, we never had adequate bazookas. Um, this was during the evening hours. Um, during the night, the German tanks came through the village. We had dug in in foxholes. They were coming right down the uh, streets in their, the whole tank division with infantry and back of them. SS troops, one of their best units, totally unknown to us. We feel now that it was the buildup of the bulge and our reconnaissance didn't show that they were anywhere near there. Uh, me and three or four others were in a foxhole. When the light of morning came through, there was a tank right over the top of us with its muzzle right down our foxhole. Uh, pretty near. Most, uh, as far as I know, I was just in our one company, but um, the, pretty near the entire division was either killed, captured, or uh, wounded, uh, cooks, everybody else. Uh, they captured us. Uh, I don't know how many in our company were captured, how many were killed. There was so much chaos at the time. Uh, one friend of mine from Troy uh, got killed. I saw him get killed. Uh, I guess he was the son of an RPI professor at the time. Uh, they marched us back into Hanover. and. Uh, marched us through the streets to show the civilian population uh, that they'd captured some Americans. And we were stoned and uh, we thought we were going to be killed until the German guards told us that we were infantry. Uh, apparently the entire town of Hanover was completely demolished. And uh, what they were after was Air Corps prisoners, not, not infantry. So we were kind of saved by that. It, the Germans had more respect, apparently, for infantry than they did for the Air Corps because they, they figured it was indiscriminate bombing and that stuff. So they, I guess, appreciated warfare as it is, and we got through it okay. Uh, we finally ended up in a prison camp in uh, Falling Bostel, I believe. It was outside Hanover. And as far as I know, it was only a temporary camp, although it was a big one. And we were interviewed uh, individually, but it was the interview uh, in our respects was nominal. They already knew what division we were in. They knew where we came from. They told me right to my face what boat we came over on from uh, uh, 
United States to England, and they knew where we were in England. They told us everything. We told them nothing. Uh, I don't. I could never figure the purpose of it, but that was the gist of it. Uh, the we were then we were there only a short time, and they took us by boxcar to a camp in New Brandenburg, which was near the Baltic Sea. Uh, I, I forget the names of the camps, 11B and 2A and whatever. Uh, and uh, it was a long trip by boxcar, and, it, and this was what you read in the papers. It was, we were locked in and bombed and uh, didn't know where the hell we were going or anything else. Um, no food, uh, no uh, no bath facilities, bathroom facilities. Um, but we ended up in New Brandenburg, which was a beautiful city as far as we can see, that had not been touched by the war. It's apparently not touched by the war. Uh, and the permanent, our permanent camp there was uh, a normal POW camp. We were in compounds. The Americans were in one compound, English in another, the French in another, the Slovaks in another, the Russians in another. They were all divided by barbed wire. Uh, the facilities were nearly impossible except I will say the Germans, I felt, lived up to the Geneva Convention the best they could under the circumstances that they could themselves. They were hurting, hurting at that time, too. Was, uh, uh, they weren't much better off than we were. Uh, it was a period of time when apparently gasoline was in short supply with the Germans. Their food was in short supply. Uh, we had guards in the camp that most of them were in, had been in World War I. They were 70 years old. A few had come off the Russian front, the younger ones, which were tough guards, but most of the guards were older. A lot of them had sons that were prisoners over in the United States. Uh, they helped us out quite a bit kept us away from the SS troops when we were out in the fields. Uh, it seemed to try to help us. Uh, prison life was, it was cold, it was, we were, it was average in that area, it was around the Baltic Sea in, in November, December, in December. Uh, it, they said it was 30 degrees below zero most of the time. Although it was a, what they called a dry cold, you didn't feel it as much. Uh, camp life was uh, uh, ersatz coffee in the morning made out of German bark, apparently. Uh, once in a while during the day, uh, you'd get a hot soup, a thin hot soup of some sort. Uh, Hardly anything else. We survived for about three or four months. Uh, we were by our, where our camp was, was very near the Russian front. The Russians were advancing very fast. And uh, our planes at that time were bombing the Russian front continually around the city of Stettin, which was a, apparently a area where they were, where we were going after uh, with our planes. Uh, the English would bomb, I don't know, during the day and we'd bomb at night, they'd bomb at night. They'd come over our camp continually. We thought we were going to be uh, demolished by our own troops every night, but apparently they knew where we were and they'd drop flares around the camp and go on. So uh, uh, we were saved from that, but we never knew. Uh, as time matured, uh, 
the Germans sent us out on work details on the farms around the area. Uh, me and uh, uh, four or five others went to this one farm. Uh, the farms were apparently owned by Germans, but operated by so-called French prisoners, French collaborators, uh, which we didn't know, we didn't know if we could trust or not. A, uh, something they told us were the truth and some why. We lived in barns on the hay, uh, were fed probably a little better than we would have been in prison camp. Um, but uh, I remember one instance where they had, I guess, cattle on the farm and we wanted to drink the milk and the, I remember the French told us don't drink it, it's not good and we didn't know whether to, we were desperate for something to, and we didn't know who to believe and not to believe and this went on and a couple of the fellows died on the farm from gangrene from frozen feet right next to me. Uh, uh, one time we were sent out uh, to work in a German brewery, a small German brewery, uh, to cut ice. And uh, it was a joke because we didn't do any work, we just went through the routine of screwing around on the ice. Uh, but at that time we were fed very good with the brewery. We were, had all the beer we wanted to drink and uh, lunches were hot soup with real meat in them and so forth. It was a little bit different, but that was, was short-lived. <clears throat> um, it came about, and I don't, I'm vague on months because we didn't know, we knew when Christmas was, but after that we didn't know what day it was or month. We had no, we had rumors that the Americans were advancing. The Germans didn't tell us much. They had rumors that the war was getting closer to end. We knew we knew the Russians were close to us because we could hear the fire and we could see the fires of the cities being burned. So well, all of a sudden, probably in February or March, I don't know, the Germans got us all together and they decided to evacuate us towards the American front. And that was this quite famous where everybody was long marches during across Germany. And uh, there, the troops kept being added to the, uh, uh, the prisoners from these various camps kept being added and the lines kept getting longer. It was in the middle of winter, we slept out on the snow every night, once in a while in a barn. Uh, the Germans tried their best probably to help us survive because uh, they were starving too. Uh, the, uh, we didn't have any water to drink. We, I remember one instance where we tried to drink out of puddles and the Germans shot at us and wouldn't let us drink out of the water. They, we don't know if it was for our good or not for our good, but they, they would have killed us uh, if we started to drink. We felt that anyway. Uh, and it was a hell for probably two or three months. I, I lose track of time. I wish I knew, uh, but uh, we, it seemed like we were on the road until the end of April. We knew that Roosevelt had died. Somehow that got to us. We knew the Americans were closing in. We knew the Russians were coming the other way and we felt we were being squeezed on both sides. And uh, in uh, probably April, we got to a river and it was a big river and to this date, I don't know which one it was, the Ruhr, the Rhine, the, they are all the same. The one was R O E R, one was R U H R. We never know, and nobody give a darn. Um, the Germans tried to march us, get us across the river, 
on a bridge which I would estimate <clears throat> it was much bigger than the Hudson River, the bridge is going across the Hudson here, and we were constantly strafed by our own planes all the time. Because they did, we were all mixed up with the German soldiers, everything was in chaos. We got across the river. Uh, I w remember one instance of running under the bridge on the other end, and there was a German uh, soldier under there, and him and I were there to, under there together. Uh, he looked quite young, and he talked English, and I asked him, I said, how old are you? And he says, 14. And uh, and he was scared, and we were more so, and it was everybody's survival. Uh, after that, we didn't know where we were. We didn't know who the Germans had, our guards had completely lost track of them, and we escaped for a couple of days, but we didn't know what area we were in. We could hear small arms fire all over the place. All of a sudden, a, uh, a German infantry unit came through to us and got into us, and they said, you better get across the river because we've got orders to shoot everybody, and the Americans probably have orders to shoot you too. Uh, so we tried to get back across the river. The bridge was still standing. Uh, we managed to get across the river, and a very instant. Uh, thing hap interesting happened then is we had no food. We, the Germans had no food. Uh, the head of the German guard unit was a, either a captain or a colonel. They had no mechanical uh, facilities. Uh, the, the German, I'll call him a captain, was in a horse and wagon with his girlfriend or wife or whatever. Uh, they ended up that night, the Germans ended up that night killing the horse and eating the horse, uh, which was, showed how desperate they were. Uh, and just prior to that, we had gone through miles and miles of woods where the German planes had hidden thousands of planes in the woods with no gas to operate and they were using, we understood that you were not using all the gas to operate their tank core rather than the air. Uh, but it just amazed me at the number of planes that they had and uh, uh, and just, had just prior to that we had saw our first German so-called jet at the time, the first one, we didn't know what it was up in the sky but it was just uh, different. We knew there was something new that they had. Uh, and of course, all, all during this time that we were on the march, we, we saw these bombs going off, these self-guided bombs going off into England. We, knew, we didn't know what they were either, had no idea. Uh, finally, we got to a town, even though we were close to the American lines, we got to a town that, and the, our German guards told us, they said, we're going to, the plan is for the Americans and the Germans to combine and start to fight the Russians. Now this was totally unheard of to us, but apparently after the war we have learned, I've learned that there was some truth to this. And it's been, apparently there was talk of it, but the Germans were absolutely convinced and they had half convinced us that that was going to be the, the uh, that's how it was going to work. Well, we were in this small town and uh, uh, the Americans apparently were advancing very fast. The Russians were right on top of us apparently. Um, and uh, I remember there was a Red Cross train going through with all markings on the thing, uh, but it was all filled with German troops and it was, they were evacuating under the auspices of the Red Cross. Uh, but it was just chaos. So 
we, the Americans, uh, the prisoners that, that were there, would talk the uh, civilians into putting out white flags all over the place and indicating that they were going to give up. And we didn't we didn't know to which troops because they were both right near us. Well, it ended up that the Seventh Armored Division, I think, please, the Seventh Armored Division came through and liberated us at the time. But at the same time, Russian planes were all over the sky, ready right to bomb us. Uh, uh, it was so close. And uh, the American, uh, the Seventh Armored, apparently put out some kind of flaps on the ground that identified where who was who. And that's the only thing that saved us from being just bombed the hell out of it by the Russians. Uh, after that, uh, they took us back to what they called a de-lousing de facility where we went through the showers and uh, new uniforms and uh, it was a temporary camp set up but with miles of former prisoners, American prisoners going through the facility. It was a monstrous place. Um, from then on, we were taken back uh, by C-47s to Camp Lucky Strike, which was the debarking area, I guess. It was where all ex-POWs went through, and uh, we just want, of course, we were we wanted to eat as much as we could eat, and they stopped us. They fed us very slowly because we were dehydrated. Everybody was dehydrated, and uh, I remember. I think I don't know. I think we were at this camp about maybe a month or so. Uh, we didn't know what we were going to do do with us, and I remember. Uh, uh, Eisenhower came through one day and talked to us and said, Do you want, he, they gave us a choice of going for a month in London, Paris, or Brussels, or going home. Well, 100% says go home. Uh, and I remember Eisenhower said, Do you, are you willing to be, to double load the boats to go home and live on deck half the time? He was in, Yes. And uh, so uh, they sent us back on a ship, uh, um, got into New York Harbor, and it was on board. But just to see the Statue of Liberty, uh, it was so um, exciting a thing that everybody went to one side of the ship and I remember the boat li uh, listed where they had to go back on the other side because everybody's on one side of the ship and it was that exciting and they had the bands and the fire boats and it was quite a thing to see you know you just remember it once in a lifetime um, and uh, the went back we had a comp all kinds of physicals and interrogations of who mistreated us and names and all this stuff. Uh, and I remember one instance of which was quite humorous too, um, when I think back on it, is uh, when we were issued new uniforms in the our camp, in Camp Lucky Strike after we were liberated, they gave us what they called an Eisenhower jacket, which was brand new at the time, and they only gave it to us. And, uh, well, apparently all the regular soldiers and the officers and everybody wanted an Eisenhower jacket. And uh, I remember I traded mine for, a, I guess some of them had come through the camp that had been up in the North Pole or somewhere up in Alaska and they had these beautiful big parkers. And I said, Christ, I'll take one of those any time. So I traded that for it. And I got, I remember getting back and going through the, to the physical in New York City, and, uh, and one of the American doctors looked at the jacket and he said, where'd you get that? And I said, I, tr I traded for it over in, in uh, France. 
And he says, how much do you want for it? I said, I want to sell it. He said, well, you're not going to get through this. I'm not going to approve you getting through unless you give me that jacket. <laughs> and, uh, you know, half void and half not. And uh, I didn't get rid of it. But it was uh, things, it was, uh, it was just something you would never think of, that uh, facilities that you had. Uh, and we had all kinds of parties. I mean, uh, e eating was just, to us, was what we had dreamed of for six months as a POW. And many of the prisoners had been prisoners for much longer than that. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was just an exciting time. Uh, they, uh, then they uh, let us go home on furlough, I forget for how long probably uh, a month, and they gave us uh, the opportunity to go to some exclusive resort for R&R. &R. Uh, they didn't, I don't think they called it R&R &R then, uh, and we went to the Lake Placid Club, which was that time was a multi-million dollar exclusive thing. It isn't today, but then it was the Millionaire's Resort in Lake Placid, and uh, with everything, afternoon teas and horseback ride, anything you wanted, it was there. It was just out of this world. I remember bringing my now wife, the girlfriend then, up for a week, and it was just, you know, a, a different world. And uh, after that was over, we were assigned to guard German prisoners as retribution. So they sent us over to Taunton, Massachusetts at Camp Mile Standish, which was a uh, camp which I don't know if it was set up before or not, but uh, uh, the uh, we they assigned us to guard guarding Germans one day maybe up in the towers, the next day we had uh, a town patrol where we had to go to either Attleboro or Taunton or another town over there three of them together that where we had town patrol because at the time this camp was also accepting air corps and infantry that were coming back from Europe at the time and we were supposed to uh, try and keep peace with everybody coming back to rejoice and going through this camp and it was just hell on earth there but you know the other way around it was just these thousands of troops coming back and going through their first night in America and we were trying to keep control of, of them too. So we had to... Let's hold on for a second. I think we have to switch tapes. <coughs> uh, uh, at the time, uh, I, I remember the days that we were guarding the Germans in their compound. Now, these were Germans that had been captured at the first part of the war. They were mainly submariners that had been captured all around our coast. And they were really the elite of the German army, and uh, uh, most of them spoke English. Um, they had their own uh, mess halls, uh, ate as good or better than the Americans. They had it made. Uh, they didn't want to go home. Uh, they, uh, I remember many times we, as guards, ate in their mess halls rather than ours. We we go in and say, "Well, cook up a dozen eggs for us," and said, and they were most of them were pretty good cooks too. And they were, uh, uh, but uh, they didn't want to escape. They wanted to stay here, even though I remember being in the guard houses and. The camp. They gave us these new submachine guns, which spit out about 
30 bullets a second. It was We never used them. We didn't know how to use them, they, uh, but they were there. And, uh, uh, and then they, some nights we would go around the prison camp in the jeeps and guard around that way too. But nobody ever cared about escaping, as far as we could see. Uh, um, and uh, as the time, I, it's, I felt at the time that we were uh, in this uh, Camp Miles Standish. Uh, that the Americans didn't know what to do with us. But uh, we kept hearing rumors that we would be reassigned to go to the war in Japan. And and that was the, the last thing we wanted, of course. Uh, but um, the, I think it got into uh, August, September, August, and I, they, I guess I had a weekend home or something. And a friend of mine uh, that I had went to college with before, and he lived up in the Adirondacks, and he says, "How about going on a uh, overnight trip? We'll go up on top of Whiteface Mountain and stay up overnight up there." So we did, and. When we come down, we didn't know the war with Japan was over and, uh, until we got down to the the bottom of the base camp and uh, found the war and Japan was over. And, and of course that was a big relief because I, we honestly thought we were going to go to Japan, go through the invasion there. Uh, and uh, so after I got discharged, I think in December of Forty-five, I guess. Uh, I the first thing I wanted to do to go back to college because I missed two years, and uh, I applied to Syracuse University and got in, but no problem. And uh, went year round to. I had. I, I was only a freshman when I went in the army, and. Uh, Decided to go year round, so I finished three years and two by going year round to college and got out. Uh, I want to get out ahead of the most. I thought I had a year on most of the uh, ex or the GI students by getting out a year earlier. So uh, and it was it was an advantage. I had an opportunity to picking jobs. It was jobs were wide open and. Uh, I took a job uh, with Dun & Bradstreet, which was in my field somewhat. Either uh, I went, I majored mainly in the Maxwell Graduate School at Syracuse, which was, uh, and most of them went to government jobs uh, in Washington. But uh, uh, I went with Dun & Bradstreet and stayed with them for 25 years, uh, working in upstate New York and parts of Vermont, parts of Massachusetts, and uh, until I started getting these uh, panic attacks. Uh, uh, the panic attacks started by one night I was coming home from work and I went to get a haircut and I just felt with this cloth over the front of me that uh, I just wanted it off and I wanted to get out. It just absolutely out of no uh, problems in the past. Twenty-five years from college to work, I had absolutely no problems, and all of a sudden this thing hit me. And uh, from then on, for quite a few years, it was hell as far as trying to do my job because my job was going in these larger buildings with to interview accountants and lawyers and uh, professional people, and it was hell on earth to try and do it. Uh, I couldn't stand going down in closed spaces or high places, or, uh, and then to travel, I anything uh, within the 30 mile radius, I had no problem. As soon as I went over, I had a in my mind, a 30-mile radius, if I went over that, 
I couldn't do it. I just went panicked. And uh, I, uh, so I resigned uh, without telling them what my problem was. Uh, the, uh, and uh, I let it go for a couple of years and then I found that there was a, a specialist that uh, the Army had for panic attacks. I didn't know other people were getting them. And uh, so I went down to the Veterans Administration and I found by that time this doctor that was supposed to be a specialist throughout the United States had, resi had retired. But I went through the program anyway and a couple years of uh, intensive uh, uh, experimenting, I'd call it, uh, which wasn't doing me much good. Uh, one one uh, uh, medicine would make you feel like a zombie, and uh, uh, it. And all of a sudden, I met a, another fellow ex-prisoner that had been through the same thing, and. He said, why don't you take, uh, ask him to give you this medicine. Do you want me to mention the name? Uh, Paxil. Uh, and he says it's pretty well cured me. And I took it and the thing was like night and day with me. It's, it's something that affects the, the chemical in your brain and uh, from then on, uh, I've had no problems with it, except I'm still uh, a little skeptical when I see long hallways. Although it doesn't restrict me, I'm skeptical. Um, the uh, with me, the the Veterans Administration, even though I have outside insurance, uh, I better be careful here. Uh, the, the VA has done one hell of a job. Uh, I think they uh, try more with the ex-prisoners of war than they do maybe many of their patients. They, we get very high preference down there, uh, priorities. Um, the I still use it as most for most of my medical problems, although some I've used outside facilities. Um, and today, uh, I'm glad I went through all the experiences I had. I, in one way, I don't blame anything that the Germans did, that people themselves, I think, tried in every way. They knew, I think they felt in their minds that at least the ground troops were a necessity in battle. I think they had held it against Air Corps for their supposed indiscriminate bombings. Uh, but I just think the German, German philosophy was that war uh, on both sides. They respected both sides. I felt in the prison camps they respected the Canadians the most, Americans second, the English third, and they had less respect for their own allies than uh, they did for us. Uh, now, in our prisoner of war organization, uh, which was is probably in the local or area, probably uh, half Air Corps people and half ground troops, um, I feel that probably, well, I think most of them have some disrespect for the Germans, but I think other ones respect them for their integrity. Uh, but the ones that were prisoners in Japan was an entirely different story. Their experiences were nightmares compared to ours. 
uh, and uh, to this day they just despise it. Uh, so I, I guess that's my story up to date. I I'm fairly healthy for a 76 year old. Uh, very happily married and uh, happy I went through every experience, uh, although a few of them I wouldn't, got, wouldn't want to go through again. Uh, but I have a lot of respect for the military, um, for the United States and their help of uh, trying to still find ex-POWs and to, to get to the bottom of stories and to see who was responsible for what. I guess that's the story. Well, I'm going to ask a couple, a couple of questions. Uh, great uh, interview, Wayne. I mean, um, there's very little I can think to ask you, but I did want to ask you about a couple of things. When you were in the uh, ASTP, when did you get the word that you want to go infantry? When we wanted to? It, no, we when, when did they tell you that you were no longer going to continue? Uh, well, it, I'll tell you, the, uh, there's a book been written on this, of the fiasco of the ASTP program. It's a very interesting book. Uh, I have it home if you want. I've given it to a lot of men that were in this program. Uh, there was lots of rumors of how this thing st started. The the story that was started, the ASTP program was started, and probably the V-12 Naval program too, is that the colleges were hurting so much for students that uh, they asked the government to maybe help out a little bit in getting students back, the male student back. And uh, the, uh, uh, so the pro, as I understand it, there were about 300,000 in the uh, Army program, and I think they had expanded that somewhat after I got into it by getting uh, st students somewhat out of high schools, even that with a pre-ASTP or some kind of a program. Now, some of the ones that were in the ASTP program were already graduates. Now, I go out with a friend that had graduated from Columbia University and they sent him into an expanded uh, ASTP program to learn Spanish, I believe, even though he was a journalism student, I believe. And uh, the, uh, the rumors that they st stopped the program, the one rumor that was very prevalent was that a senator's son had funked out. And now that's take for what it's worth. Uh, but there were a lot of uh, animosity in the military against the program. A lot of the generals thought that the, 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 these young 18, 19 year olds could better be used immediately in combat and so forth. Uh, and. Uh, the, Apparently, uh, this book that they have out, it was very well written, told who was for it and who was against it, and there was a lot of fights in the Senate over this. And uh, all was, it, it seemed like it was stopped overnight. It was, I think it was around August or sometime. And uh, they just seemed to, and it was at a time, though, when our invasion was well underway and the, our troops were depleted in Europe and they needed replacements. We had, in fact, a lot of ASTPs you went in as replacements, which were even worse than going in with a division. And, uh, but the feeling, I think, of this group was that the government really threw uh, a lot of people into the wrong places. Uh, we, we you kind of felt when, uh, I kind of felt that maybe the theory behind the thing was that they wanted to keep maybe some higher IQs 
out of combat. And now maybe it's true or not, I don't know. Because the requirements for this program were much higher than officers candidate school to get into it. You had to have an AGCT of much higher. And uh, whether that had any bearing on it, I don't know. Uh, but uh, it was an awful loss of a lot of talented people. Uh, that, that, because most of them went into the divisions that really took a beating. The 106, which was even, they took more of a beating than we did in the bulge. And now we were a free bulge uh, unit that got decimated, even though our division continued on. And, uh, but one of the real disgraces is that Nobody in the Army Specialized tra tra Training Program got be beyond uh, PFC, except on combat, in combat. And a few got into, uh, were made officers in combat, the few that survived this thing. But I just felt it was a, a big misuse of uh, military talent at the time. Uh, we, we were promised uh, OCS and it never materialized, never had an interview. Uh, uh, and there was a lot of bad feelings. This, uh, this book that's out is uh, very, ex very excellently done and really dug into the problems. And uh, uh, in fact, since I've had the book, I've uh, talked a lot of other ex-BOWs who uh, uh, went and bought the book. It's, uh, yeah. But you never really knew what was back. The, you, the, the book shows that these generals argued over this program whether it should be discontinued or not. So, uh, what it meant to the war, I don't know. I have no idea. But uh, it just seemed like it was an awful misuse of uh, people going to the wrong places. Well, how did you feel personally? I mean, you had been a college graduate. You thought you were on your way to Well, I wasn't a college graduate. I had one year. Mm -hmm. But uh, there were a lot that were college graduates. Uh, now, a few of the college graduates that had uh, the advanced uh, training did get uh, now, this one friend of mine was in the 78th Division, and they were in combat, but he got a job as head of the editor of the newspaper, but with his background in journalism or something, it, it made a natural thing. But uh, he, he uh, and uh, there, there was nothing wrong, I mean, my attitude, there was nothing wrong with the combat or where they were assigned, but it was the way that it was done in bulk, that they just absolutely disregarded talent or uh, what people's backgrounds were. Uh, it, it, the opposite of what, it, when you went into service, it was, they looked at what you had, apparently with this. And the thing is, they put us into divisions that they knew there would be problems. We had, as I understand it, our 84th division had people in their divisions that were disabled. With, I understood there were some with one arm and this stuff. I don't I have no truth of it, but they say this thing was absolutely a division that was going nowhere and they wanted to get rid. They got rid of half the division. They took them out of the military. And the rest were uh, Indians from the Southwest. Uh, and uh, it was just a conflict of uh, personalities. And all our cadre, our cadre were the ones that were left. And we had no opportunity, no opportunity to advance beyond uh, PFC. Uh, I got discharged as a T5 just out of the requirement that every POW had to be advanced one thing, and uh, that was it. Uh, and uh, 
I, I don't have any ill feeling towards rank at all. I'm not a military person, but I just felt that uh, there was something wrong, something uh, wrong. There was, it just seemed like there, there was a dispute in the higher up uh, bureaucracy somewhere uh, as to what to do with this thing. But it was a, they were desperate times. They were times when they needed numbers in Europe. They needed numbers to replace these decimated divisions. And that's where it ended up, apparently. Uh, our training uh, in between the time we, we left college, uh, the ASTP program, until we actually went into combat, was uh, probably half adequate, I would say. We had the training, we had, our basic training was good. We had the same basic training as, as officers candidate school at the infantry school and went through a very rigorous 13 weeks of uh, basic, probably more than the regular troops had. But uh, the, uh, I just felt that uh, even in our training that we had with the division itself wasn't uh, adequate. We didn't have, I remember in uh, field training where to dig a foxhole, nobody give a damn whether we dug it or not. And uh, uh, it's, you know, we didn't realize what we were, <laughs> Missing. We were. We we didn't. We weren't serious. I. I really. I don't know. I just felt something was. We had. Uh, I remember in basic training we had excellent officers in basic training. I. Uh, my lieutenant there had been through the DF parade and uh, they. We had excellent troops. But as, as soon as we got into our division here in the states, the capacity of the officers and the things was lacking, totally lacking. I, uh, I remember I, we had a captain that was an ex-Coca-Cola salesman and uh, you just felt, uh, I don't know, it, it just felt that there was a consistent clash of, uh, we, we didn't operate as a unit because of the clash of personalities. Mm. It was, they, they were resentful of us for being sheltered kids maybe, I don't know, and we were eventing with them for education maybe, something, I don't know. Uh, but it was, it wasn't a group, it wasn't a coordinated group. And, and I feel maybe that was with the other divisions too. Uh, from what I've talked to kids, uh, people. We're just about out of time. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No, but I appreciate the time to do this. I. Go ahead, that it can uh, maybe give somebody an education in the future of what happened. I feel the kids today are totally lacking in any any respect. They have no no knowledge that the, with the war, they uh, have little care about it. Uh, I it shocks me, absolutely shocks me. What uh, uh, thought? Uh, uh, you, you have the feeling, I have a feeling every day as I go around that I look at people and I look at the kids and uh, the youth and uh, something's lacking, something, something is totally amiss. Uh, uh, I, I know in, uh, and I know the ones in our organization feel the same way that uh, uh, I, I know one instance, I go to a cardiologist uh, uh, outside, he lives in Del Mar, and uh, I remember on Veterans Day, I guess I was in there, had an appointment for Veterans Day, and uh, I guess the kids had the day out of school, and he, he, he said to me, he said, do you, he said, you know, he says, I asked my son uh, what they had the day off for, and the kid says, I don't know, I have no idea. And no idea what the day, what we had the better day. He said, 
He said, well, you better get back to school and find out what the hell he got the day off for. And uh, that stuck in my mind. Uh, uh, the, uh, I, I just go into the groups. I was over to a Christmas party last night, and uh, there was a lot of people there in their early 20s. And uh, I don't know, I mentioned just something about something, and it just went over their heads, I thought. There's something, there's a whole generation missing here somewhere. It's, it, my son is uh, 31 and a college graduate, a guidance counselor, guiding other kids. And uh, he has no idea. I, I, I mean, I'll talk to him about uh, service. They have no, they don't care. They don't have any idea. They have no idea what uh, war is. Uh, uh, no, I don't think uh, patriotism. I don't think uh, it, it, it. Something's lacking in the schools, in the philosophy, maybe morals in the government today, with our administration that we've had in policy. I don't want to get into that, uh, <laughs> uh, but. Uh, I just feel that our country is the less for it, whatever it is. Uh, it's just like Tom Brokaw said that a, it's the greatest generation and uh, I don't want to toot our horns, but I think when we look back on it, uh, we'll see there was something to it. Uh, that I don't know if we'll ever have it again. Good.